Hello, everyone. I'm David Morris, is the analyst who manages Insider Intelligence's payments and commerce coverage. It's my pleasure to be here at the Politico Finance Summit to discuss two key trends that will significantly impact the payments landscape in not only 2021, but beyond. Our first topic is government regulation and policy initiatives, big tech and payments in the crosshairs. Let's start with a question, how big is too big? World governments uh, increasingly and more vociferously agree that big tech is indeed too big. If you take a look at what's going on in the United States, three different examples here uh, from three different parts of the legislative and policy development landscape. The US House of Representatives, a legislative branch of the federal government. The US Department of Justice, the judicial branch of the federal government, and a suit filed by 46 of 50 states in concert with the US Federal Trade Commission itself, an arm of a US federal department, all alleging monopoly power, anti-competitive exclusionary practices, and so forth by the US big tech players. The bottom line is that these initiatives cut across political party lines, demonstrating the political will to regulate, and that political will will likely strengthen this year. If we take a look more specifically at payments, are payments too big? Are payments companies too big? Well, the People's Bank of China thinks so, finalizing rules this February that seek to decrease alleged antitrust behavior in the payments industry, putting homegrown giants Ant Group and Tencent within its crosshairs. And also this month, let's take a look at a bill that's been introduced by moderate Democrat, Senator Amy Klobuchar, the Competition Antitrust Law Enforcement Reform Act. Now this is a big deal because it attempts to shift the burden of proving a merger's impact on competition to the merging parties. And the outcome here is that the merging parties must therefore meet that burden for the merger to go forward. That's a higher standard that's required for that merger to go forward through the, the review process. It also calls out mega mergers worth over $5 billion, targets mergers that increase market concentration, and it singles out acquiring competitors, even nascent ones by dominant firms. If your Fiserv does this affect in retrospect that first data acquisition? Uh, if your Visa already uh, called into question with the played acquisition, does that call into question your ability to move forward with that further? The bottom line here is that payments companies are facing growing regulatory scrutiny across the globe. That intensity will also likely increase. And if you take a look at Europe, the European Payments Initiative launched just this summer in 2020 by 16 European banks backed by the ECB, which aims to create a unified payment solution across Europe, replacing existing domestic schemes and importantly, including a bank-owned digital wallet covering all retail use cases to be launched in a year. That's the aim. Why? Homegrown champion, that's why, to be able to compete against Visa and MasterCard, which dominate payments in Europe. Reversing declines in domestic scheme share and enhancing payments and data sovereignty. Also being able to create that bank-owned digital wallet solution would enable a homegrown solution to compete against big tech. The bottom line is that sovereignty over payments and data will be a front and center issue for years to come. Let's switch into our second trend, blockchain payments. One winner, cross-border payments. And we can take a look at this from the standpoint of usage, growth trajectory, incumbent buy-in, and funding. Via these means, we can assess the degree of maturity that cross-border payments have in the marketplace. 
Currently, RippleNet is a drop in the bucket. Three million transactions in 2020 compared to cross-border incumbent Swift with 9 billion estimated transactions in 2020. But the trajectory tells a story. Five-fold growth in RippleNet in 2020, Juniper Research also estimating that blockchain payments could make up almost 10% of all B2B cross-border payments in just three more years. As far as incumbent buy-in in the US, you have PCN Bank, Santeter, and others using RippleNet, and also a techno techno technology incumbent buy-in from IBM, launching WorldWire in 2019, the blockchain-based cross-border payments and foreign exchange network. And funding also tells a story. Bottom line, blockchain cross-border payments are moving quick, quickly from nascency to the mainstream. Another blockchain payments up and comer, card payments. Now usage here is also a drop in the bucket. An example, the CoinZoom Visa card. Uh, users spend about a million dollars per month on the card. Overall crypto card volume now is low, but the trajectory here is also quite positive. More new card programs slated to enter the market in 2021, including one by crypto broker Bitpanda and a partnership between Circle and Visa, launching a corporate card, enabling spend with stablecoin this year. Incumbent buy-in, uh, Visa has 31 crypto cards as, the, as of the end of 2020, plus one debit card. MasterCard has seven crypto debit cards. Both of these entities are looking to fast track digital currency, wallets, and crypto uh, card issuing, respectively. American Express also dipping into the crypto space, uh, investing in Falcon X and Apple Pay, uh, enabling integration with the BitPay card. Funding here also tells a story. Uh, Bitpanda raising 52 million and crypto startup Fold raising two and a half million to further their growth. The bottom line, blockchain card payment share will grow as payment incumbents help smooth the way. So those are our two key trends, government regulation and policy initiatives, big tech and payments in the crosshairs and blockchain payments handicapping the winners. Thanks very much and enjoy the summit. Good afternoon. If you're just tuning in, my name is Bjarke Sutmeier and you're watching Politico Live. This is our first spotlight discussion uh, on the specific topic of digital finance. And specifically today, uh, we're going to be homing in on the subject of uh, payment services in Europe. This is an interactive um, debate, so please do get involved. You can send in your questions through the Swap Card app uh, by clicking on the live discussion box. Uh, otherwise, please do get also involved with our live poll, which is presented by MasterCard today. And it tries to answer the question, when it comes to payments, which of the below do you believe consumers in Europe need most? Is it A, instant payments, B, greater transparency and protection, C, digital euro, or D, the new pan-European schemes? 
Uh, you can also tweet this session with the hashtag PoliticoFS. Six years ago, I arrived here in Brussels, and there was only a very small group of us that were nerdy enough to sit down and talk about fintech and how it would then interact with EU policy. Um, now, in 2021, the Commission has its own fintech team, uh, and it's one of the main priorities of the new, uh, of the new Commission. Um, not only do we want to make the recovery green, but we also want to make it digital. These include topics like artificial intelligence, digital financial assets, and new payments, which is why we're here today. And I have a fantastic uh, group of panelists to go through this particular topic with me. Uh, introducing them in no particular order uh, is the European Parliament's Stefan Berger, who is from the European People's Party. Give us a wave, Stefan, and I could see you. Um, this is also a man who is the rapporteur, in other words, the chief negotiator, to try and figure out a negotiating stance within the Parliament for the market in crypto assets regulation, otherwise known as Mika. Then uh, from Sweden, we have Cecilia uh, Skingsley, who is the first deputy governor at Riksbank. Hey, son. Talk to you. And then last but not least, we have Jason Lane, the executive vice president, market development uh, Europe at MasterCard. Thank you all so much for joining me here today. I'm going to jump straight into it with, with you, Cecilia, uh, if I may. I think a good way to get into this debate as a whole is just to sort of talk about why payments has become the new obsession of fintechs. Uh, and I think you know, Sweden would be a perfect place to dive into that question, given the fact that uh, cash use has been plummeting and uh, electronic payments has been skyrocketing. So in, in your experience, why, why do you feel that payments is, is the new area of interest for fintechs in particular? Well, I, I think um, payments is a sort of area that um, has something for everyone, independent on what sort of interest you have. It's, it's uh, it cuts through technology, economy, uh, legislation, politics, history, culture. It's um, it's a super fascinating area, and it's also an area where uh, the fundamental uh, parts have been pretty stable for sort of hundred years. Uh, most legis most countries have the legislation basically that um, the central bank issue. Um, um, the notes and coins and uh, the commercial banks do deposits and, and lending. But now as the technology has moved forward and we are go, have gone from a world where money was a physical feature into a future where, or in some cases already present, where not, nothing of this is physical but digital, um, the, um, the distribution of, of um, responsibilities between the public sector and the private sector needs to be revisited. And it's... Uh, it's a really like a horse race, both in the public sector and the private sector, on how uh, this should be uh, administered going forward. Then having a look at the, the private sector, uh, and I'll, I'll come to you, Jason. Um, I mean, MasterCard, uh, you know, together with Visa, have basically been running the show in payments in Europe for, for a long time. Uh, and yet now we're looking at uh, different ways of coming up with uh, payments, uh, instant payments, for example. Uh, I mean, is, is the credit card going to become an obsolete technology soon? Is your business model under threat? I don't believe our business model is under threat at all. Thank you, Bjork. Uh I think when we look at sort of the choice of payments, indeed, a, a credit card is one aspect for consumers to be able to sort of exercise choice in, in how they uh, uh, make a payment in the same way that they would use a debit card. Or as you're saying, there's even growing interest for instant payments. So it's very interesting how you say MasterCard and Visa potentially the, the, the dominant forces in Europe. Um, yes, uh, we, we certainly are, are, are playing uh, on, on this field, but there are many other players, uh, you know, who are operating in payments across Europe. It's a, it's a dynamic market. Um, there is plenty of competitive uh, factors and forces at play from domestic schemes uh, to new entrants to incumbents like ourselves. Um, but intrinsically, we don't necessarily think of ourselves as not being European. Um, you know, being European is actually at the very fabric of who MasterCard is. And so while our core business started out in credit cards and certainly evolved um, into uh, debit cards, you know, we're also following where the, the consumer is demanding um, that choice to go, and that is in the realm of instant payments. And certainly we've made a lot of investments 
investments to uh, build out our capability here in Europe to particularly address that consumer demand. So uh, I don't think the, the credit card is anywhere near dead. I think it's going to uh, continue to live. But certainly from our perspective, we're going to offer even more products um, to meet people's needs for where they want to go uh, around payments. Thanks for that. I'm going to come to you in a second, Stefan. Uh, if you just bear with me, I, I just have one more question for, for Jason. Um, th th there is this European payments initiative that uh, European banks have sort of banded together and, and tried to push. At the same time, I mean, uh, through no fault of uh, the likes of um, MasterCard or Visa, but I think certain experiences across the pond in the US have um, mm -hmm. brought European policymakers uh, a little bit of concern as to just how sovereign they can be when it comes to uh, things like payments. Now, Obviously, there is a concern that if a future president of the US were to suddenly say, you know what, MasterCard, uh, we don't want you handling payments uh, in this particular EU country or the EU as a whole. I'm picking extremes here, but we've re recently seen that extremes can happen. Um, I mean, do you then feel that uh, MasterCard and Visa are, are, are being unfairly attacked here when it comes to these European initiatives and call for sovereignty? No, I don't believe we're being attacked at all. And if, if anything, this is really just a call for a, a more competitive marketplace, right? And there's nothing wrong with sort of encouraging uh, a homegrown um, type element uh, or institutions such as the European Payments Initiative. You know, going back to what you just cited as sort of a, a political concern, you know, we recognize uh, Europe has a legitimate desire around pavement sovereignty, right? So we're, we're, we're very supportive of that. Um, and indeed, uh, the, the very financial institutions that are coming to sort of create um, the European payments initiatives, they are indeed our existing um, financial service customers as well. And so both them and we have our primary concern of how do you address and develop the best product and services for consumers um, to engage in either retail banking or indeed in, in the world of payments. And, uh, you know, as long as there is, a, you know, sufficient sort of, um, you know, a level playing field for all players um, to operate, indeed, that consumer or the business seeking those payment options is going to be the winner. And of course, more competition just means all of us have to lift up our bootstraps, ensure that we are bringing sort of the best and um, the brightest uh, innovations uh, to market. Ultimately, we all want to be in the position where the, uh, the consumer wins, right? But having said that, absolutely, we appreciate the political environment that uh, all of us are operating in globally, not just here in Europe. And, and so certainly um, are fully respectful of uh, the opportunity um, that's been called for in EPI. And equally, we, we see them as a competitor and also we are very open to collaborating with them because in, in many respects, um, you know, we've been SEPA compliant from day one. Um, it's not like we're going to stop business just because EPI is there. So there's plenty of opportunity for us to sort of partner with them together and also help them, um, you know, achieve that, that end goal of, of giving the best payment uh, choice to their consumers. Thanks, Jason. Um, I'm going to move to you uh, now, Stefan. Uh, just a quick plea to our audience. Uh, thank you for sending in questions. Uh, it's just an individual called Yen Liu who has uh, written me an essay. And I have to say, it's very difficult to, to be able to read the whole thing and ask a question. So if uh, people could please keep their questions quite short and snappy, and then I could be able to actually read them and, and ask them. Uh, so I'll, I'll look forward to your question, Yen Liu. Uh, moving then uh, to uh, Stefan. Um, you know, we, we've been talking about innovation in payments, uh, and obviously Cecilia helped us set the stage by looking at, uh, you know, Sweden in particular. Uh, in Germany, the, the attitude is a little bit different. I mean, their cash is still king. Uh, I'm just wondering, I mean, is Germany's obsession with cash, uh, does that make it uh, a, a, not a great market in order to be innovative in payments? Germany, uh, thank, thank you, Bjarke. Germany, um, we have a long tradition with cash money and uh, a lot of people are thinking that cash money is uh, one side of the medal of freedom uh, so um, the biggest uh, economy in europe um, is thinking about using cash money and i think this is okay but what we need and what we see is that uh, people are waiting and people are ready for a new modern and instant payment solution. So we have uh, great uh, projects like uh, um, you discussed uh, the European Payment Initiative. Um, 
And we need more developments um, from our financial sector to counterbalance uh, competitors from, uh, um, for example, America, China, or from everywhere. But for me, I think in the end, it's um, about uh, competition. But I strongly believe that we urgently need a digital euro equipped with uh, functions such as an EU wallet and instant payments so that um, the European Central Bank um, has uh, um, you know, um, uh, must come to the point that the digital euro is a, euro is, um, uh, is a development for the future. Mm. So we'll get I, to that in a second, because uh, the digital euro is obviously going to be a, a big part of the discussion today. Um, but I would like to ask you, Stefan, just a second question, specifically on stable coins. And uh, for those who, who aren't as, as uh, intensely following this debate uh, as, as our panelists here, um, I mean, stable coins is a new digital financial asset uh, that is connected or tied to a reserve of conservative assets uh, like currencies in order to maintain its, its value. Um, now, one of the points uh, of legislation that uh, Stefan will be working with uh, as part of the Mika uh, regulation is specifically what do we do with stablecoins? And this is a very topical issue at the moment because Facebook, together with about half a dozen, uh, two dozen um, other companies, have decided that they want to push forward a payments initiative, which was originally called Libra and now is called DM. Now, uh, one of the things that uh, I think is particularly poignant to this, just very basically, starting with the question, Stefan, why is it a problem if we have someone like Facebook and other tech companies coming up with a, uh, a new payments initiative? Okay, so first, it's, it's, first it's, it seems to be not a problem. Um, we can see that the tokenization of assets is a development we cannot stop. For many people, this is a positive and very welcome development. Uh, it opens the door for anyone uh, to wealth management at a low threshold, and it um, makes non-bankable assets tradable. Uh, the World Economic Forum has published uh, studies that assume that in 2029, the value of approximately 10 trillion US dollars will be tokenized and uh, yeah, with the help of the blockchain. So we are talking about a very, a very huge market. But uh, if you see further developments in the market, we have, uh, for example, developments like DM, um, like DM. Facebook has almost two billion users, and by introducing their own currency, Facebook could gain overnight the power of a central bank. This means they will be able to steer demand and supply for over 2 billion users. And I believe this kind of power should be in the hands of a central bank and not uh, in the hands of a private company or association like the DM Association um, in Switzerland. Let's so, take that. Let's take that and then move it specifically because we have the pleasure of having uh, a central banker with us today. Um, so, uh, Cecilia, I mean, I mean, do you, do you f have the same concerns as Stefan? I mean, do you feel that this particular initiative, uh, DM, uh, would basically make someone like Facebook the central banker for for 2.7 billion people? I'm not sure the onboarding would be that strong, but I, I think what Stefan is is uh, is uh, is saying in a very very elegant way is that um, money, uh, the, the the provision of money and a good version of money, meaning being as a stable store of value and efficient medium of exchange, has over history been one of the core businesses or core offers that a, that a state uh, has to its, uh, to its citizens. Um, and you have to remember that um, um, the, um, the security of money uh, and the monetary sovereignty 
uh, in a country has been always associated with that it has been something that has been offered by 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 the public sector. It's also uh, regulate, regulated by by the legislators, so it has a direct connection between um, the uh, the electorate and and the the central bankers, such as myself, who has the responsibility of of providing uh, the system with with the, the economy with a good version of money. And and the second thing I'd like to point out one of the things we the reason for why we're struggling with the with the payment market in the way we do is that it's not uh, it's not a competitive market it's not even a contestable market is has large um, economies of scales it has large network effects so you can't have many players on this this market and a lot of the and what do you do as a as a public sector uh, representative when you look at the market well you have to realize that the infrastructure here is super critical. Uh, and I think the public sector here has to move, central banks, but the public sector as a whole has to step forward and, and update their offers when it comes to the infrastructure, what we offer in terms of our real-time gross settlement systems, what we offer in terms of mm -hmm. instant settlements, so that the private sector has more greater ability to compete uh, than they've had so far. And this is independent on the fact that we are also taking now leapfrogs in terms of uh, the digital development. Do you like DM? Do you ask me if I like DM? Yeah. I see it, I see it as an interesting uh, uh, sign that the, uh, those of us who works for the fiat money system in the world hasn't really been uh, fully successful uh, when it comes to uh, people's adaptation. We we do know that about 1.5 billion people on the planet are underserved by very basic uh, financial services, like being able to to make safe and efficient and cheap uh, payments. And I think what the uh, the DM uh, consortium has pointed out is that the technology is now so advanced that you can actually offer this. Uh, and if I think if stable coins like the DM project meet all the public sector regulations and criteria that we set up, because we need to think about consumer protection, investor protection, anti-money laundering regulations, etc., I, I don't see any obvious reasons why it should not be existing. But so far, we haven't seen any stable coin uh, initiative that that are meeting these uh, regulatory demands that we need to have in place if you want to have uh, order and, and law and, and, and stability to, in the monetary system as a whole. Thanks. Jason, what do you make of this? I mean, do you, do you think that it's, uh, it's politicians and uh, supervisors just getting in the way of information, or do they have a point? No, I, um, I don't believe they're getting in the way at, at all, right? There's some really genuine concerns about, uh, you know, how to sort of ensure that there is a level of trust and a level of oversight um, in, any, in any form of, of, of payments. And I absolutely agree, you know, there is uh, a lot to be said for how, how we start to look at stable coins. Now, it doesn't mean that stable coins or cryptocurrencies themselves are, are indeed going to be replacing, um, you know, current payment sets. You know, we, we have electronic payments today, you know, just existing alongside cash still today, 85% of all transactions globally occur in cash. So it's not like, these sort of um, rep one, one sort of uh, you know payment form replaces another. So certainly, as you look at stablecoin, you look at cryptocurrencies. These are, these are definitely incremental and additive to to the environment. And I think what gets important is sort of understanding the the, the use case. And and specifically at Mastercard, you know, we're very concerned, almost just like Cecilia was saying, about really ensuring that there is that trust. Trust is paramount um, into everything that we, we need to be doing as an industry, both from the private sector, but then also, you know, understanding, you know, what, what the public sector are also looking for. And so at Mastercard, we've adopted a couple of principles, which, um, you know, when we look at stablecoin, when we look at these new forms of payment, we really want to be able to test things. First around that is, of course, stability. And around stability, it's being sure that if there's going to be a connection to a fiat currency, this is probably a little bit preferable because it's going to be more reliable and ultimately will provide that end user the assurance uh, that they do need. The second principle we, we focus on is, of course, against consumer protection, right? How do we ensure that indeed, you know, there is payment guarantees that, that will flow through the space? And if there is fraud, that it can be managed and there is a dispute 
process to sort of deal with that. And finally, getting back to the point um, of, you know, certainty for, for regulators, being sure that anything that we do from a, a MasterCard perspective well, is fully we compliant can hear you talk, as well. Stefan. <laughs> It's, sorry, it's fully compliant as well, right? And this is compliance with, within the full regulatory space. We do think a regulatory framework is needed. It brings certainty to all parties, you know, and, um, you know, it, it's just an important part of what we do throughout the rest of the payment um, uh, ecosystem, whether it's AML or KYC. This is just as critical um, in, in, in a uh, cryptocurrency environment as well. Thank you. Uh, Harry Bridge asked the question very much about whether we could uh, dive into the world of crypto and uh, stable coins. So I, I hope, Harry, that all of that g got in there deep. Um, I will, uh, Yen Liu has very kindly come back with a very short, snappy question on uh, central bank digital currency, which is where we will come to in very much just a second. The one thing that I would like to just ask um, uh, Stefan about is that in his draft report, so the sort of founding or the, the the start for a debate on the legislation within the parliament. Um, he has suggested that the European Central Bank should have the power to say no to all stable coins, including DM. Um, and uh, I, I'm, I'm just curious very quickly, uh, Stefan, before I then ask Cecilia what she makes of this, uh, this power that we then could give to the ECB. Have you received much pushback from some of your colleagues inside of the parliament about this idea? <laughs> Yes, um, yes, of course, it's a very interesting debate. Um, and um, I'm uh, convinced that um, this is strongly necessary because uh, we need um, a public institution um, before a stablecoin is released just to say if this is this stablecoin okay or not, or does it hurt the economic system? Does it hurt or can it hurt the financial system? Um, the whole macroeconomic sphere. And so for me, um, it's uh, yeah, strongly necessary and uh, we have a big debate in the parliament. And, uh, but I'm sure that the European Central Bank is interested uh, in this power to say no to some uh, stable coins. And um, so let's, uh, so let's uh, uh, make this discussion um, and, uh, well, in, in the next months. Yeah, Cecilia, just very quickly, because I would like to, you know, jump onto the topic of uh, central bank digital currencies. Um, I mean, do you think that the European Central Bank should have the power to say no to certain stable coins such as DM? Uh, well, it, it's not in really my place to um, sitting as a, a central banker in a different country to um, have suggestions on uh, what sort of legislation the ECB should be. Um, governed by or not. Uh, but I, I would like to add that I think to, to a great extent, they already have uh, the sort of powers that, that uh, I think Stefan is, is, um, is uh, want to enforce, uh, which is that central banks and supervisory authorities have uh, a, a number of tools to sort of scrutinize the, um, the stablecoin concepts that we have seen so far. You have to meet a number of criteria if you, if you, want, to, um, if you want to launch uh, a stablecoin uh, in, in the way that we have seen so far. Um, but, but the interesting thing here is, is, is really that as people's preferences changes, and we are in an interesting part in history when technology affects people's preferences, um, we have on the public sector side uh, think, but also private sector think long and hard. How do we maintain a safe and efficient payment system um, as as um, uh, as we go forward? Uh, and the, the thing we have been looking at in Sweden is that okay, if Swedes don't no longer want to use cash to a very large extent, and cash perhaps will just be a, a sort of a default facility, a backup facility in a in a crisis situation or war situations, uh, we need to uh, be able to um, provide money in a way that uh, people are safe and and, and happy with. Mm. So that's the uh, sort of intellectual starting point for why we are investigating the Swedish version of a, of a EU euro, which we call the e -crona, and the central bank digital currency concept that we have seen being developed across the globe now is all about 
um, doing the intellectual exercise, if we yeah. need to carry on doing electronic money in a central bank money, but in an electronic form, how yeah. would you do that to meet the policy objectives you want to meet? And thanks for bringing me there uh, very, very eloquently. Uh, so the European Central Bank, uh, among other uh, central banks, is looking into this, this idea of a central bank digital currency, in particular here in the Eurozone, we would call it the digital euro. Um, I, Jason, I'd like to come to you just very quickly on this because, uh, and I'm, I'm by no means comparing you to Visa, I'm just saying that uh, a, an, an executive from Visa at a recent conference uh, stressed the importance um, of being very careful about a, a free uh, digital euro in a way because that could in a way ruin um, the opportunity for some other uh, companies to come up with uh, businesses that can then be invested in and get a return for. I mean, do you think that a free digital euro would be uh, a threat to, to the likes of MasterCard? I think um, when we talk about whether a solution or product or service is offered for free, um, you know, that notion just doesn't exist anywhere, right? Um, there is always going to be cost investment required by any party um, when a, a product or service is brought to market, right? I think, you know, what's fundamentally more important for me is, is not so much um, the cost basis, but, but you know, um, as, as was mentioned previously, you know, we're already living in an environment where um, the efficiency and the, um, you know, the network effect of, of payments is, is, is sort of profound. And nowhere is our payments sort of more uh, cost effective for all users in the ecosystem than they are in Europe. And that is just hands down true uh, wherever you go. Um, and I think, uh, you know, when we look at, you know, the ability of either a digital currency um, or a stable coin, as I said earlier, these are not necessarily replacements of, of what consumers or businesses will seek to sort of engage with payments on. They're an extension of choice, right? And, um, you know, I think they're, they're the, 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 dare I say, the, the sexy intellectual thing to sort of explore at the moment. And, you know, we, we need to prove this out a little bit more. But, you know, I, I think coming back to whether um, it has cost or, or not, um, there's a, already a, a very efficient, um, you know, payments and retail banking system that's highly, regula highly regulated across Europe. And certainly we would want um, almost digital currency uh, to be um, uh, accretable, additive to, to, to what that is. And again, reassure, um, you know, consumer choice, um, but then also provide everything that we spoke about earlier around protections um, and, and really also to ensure that there is, um, you know, compliance at a regulatory uh, level as well. And just in terms of a design, um, we, are, we only have two minutes left, so, so I'll ask you, Cecilia, just to be very quickly before uh, I, I go to Stefan very finally. Um, I did promise uh, Yen Liu that I would ask her question if she came back with a snappier question. She did. Uh, so thank you very much, Yen. Um, uh, so I, my, my, the question is, uh, will you prefer to see a cash-like um, CBDC, a central bank digital currency, uh, in the future, uh, or a central bank account-based CBDC in the future? Do you have, do you have a thought there? Uh, well, it's, uh, the jury is still out, I would say. I, I think the important thing is to make the exercise and have a conversation among legislators uh, as well as within the industry and with central banks. Uh, how we want this to be organized going forward. Um, and ex the exact choices, I think, will be actually come down to uh, a political process because money is something very political. It's one of the ways uh, um, a sort of a country defines itself, how it's, it organizes that. And, and uh, it, at, the end of the end, at the end of the day, we are experts. We can provide the legislators with different uh, suggestions in a, a menu uh, but but the um, the final decisions needs to be made by 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 uh, elected people. Mm. Uh, I'm going uh, to draw our attentions to the poll. Thank you, thank you all to the audience for, for getting involved. Uh, I'll just repeat it very quickly. When it comes to payments, which of the below do you believe consumers in Europe need most? Uh, instant payments, greater transparency and protection, or a digital euro? Uh, the majority of the participants uh, voted for greater transparency and protection. Digital euro uh, came in second at 25%. Sorry, the greater transparency was 63%, and instant <coughs> payments is languishing uh, at an oh, exchange. 18%, a new pan-European scheme is, is by far the, mo the least popular at 0%. Um, Stefan, do you have a, a closing uh, thought to that poll, just very quickly before I wrap up? Yes, um, this is what we hear uh, in the parliament. People 
want to have cyber resilience, they want to have data protection, and um, they want to be informed about the use of artificial intelligence and big data and, and all what happens in the payment world. So I can uh, understand uh, this, Paul, but uh, for me, in the end, we need a solution because people are waiting for um, new, modern, and instant payment solutions. And for me, um, the best answer is uh, the development of a, a CBDC of a digital euro. Thank you so much. And thank you all very much to our panelists, uh, Jason, Cecilia, and Stefan. Greatly appreciate that. Uh, thank you. Uh, our next session is the second spotlight discussion uh, on digital finance, this time focusing on the topic of cloud technologies. Uh, it's another favorite uh, nerdy subject of mine, um, specifically in the role of the financial industry. Uh, that'll start at 10 past five, so please do stay tuned. In the meantime, uh, explore the Summit app and uh, book your uh, meetings uh, with your peers. Just before we go, I would like to, uh, again, uh, stress uh, uh, the fact that the um, the poll was sponsored uh, by uh, by um, Mastercard. Thank you all so much. Uh, have a great uh, uh, well. We'll see you soon. In any case, thank you.